test 14 Section 1 You will hear a conversation between Harry and Andrea, two students who have just finished their final exams. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Notice that an example has been done for you. This time only, the conversation relating to the example will be played first. Hi Andrea, how are you feeling now that exams are over? It's fantastic to have finished, isn't it? And to sleep in every morning. What about you? The student is happy to have finished exams, so you circle B. Now, let's begin. Answer the questions as you listen. You will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi Andrea, how are you feeling now that exams are over? It's fantastic to have finished, isn't it? And to sleep in every morning. What about you? Well, I've been catching up on sleep too. But I've got a lot to do before I leave for England. Perhaps you could give me some advice. I've got a lot of things I can't possibly take back with me, but I don't know what to do with them. Well, it depends on what sort of things they are and whether you're thinking of giving them away or selling them. Well, almost everything. Furniture, the fridge and other kitchen stuff that I bought from the previous tenant. But the new people have already got what they need, so they're not interested in buying stuff from me. I can't afford to give it away, but I'm not sure how to sell it all. Oh, and there are some clothes and books as well. Why can't you take them? The books are really heavy. It's so expensive if you exceed the airline baggage allowance. And the clothes just won't all fit in my suitcase. It's amazing how much stuff I've accumulated since I've been here. Anyway, I don't think I'll need as many summer clothes in England as I have here in Australia. I see. Well, there are several alternatives. First of all, you could put up notices around the university about the books. You know, on the notice boards in the Student Union Building and in the Economics Department. Anywhere second and third year students will see them. People are always keen to buy cheap textbooks. OK, what, what should I say on the notices? Just put the titles, authors and price you want, your name of course, and maybe put your phone number on those little tear-off tags. That's a good idea. And what about the furniture? You could try doing the same thing, but usually students are away all summer so they don't want to buy furniture now. Another place to try might be a second-hand shop. Someone from the shop will usually come around and give you a free quote, and then you can decide. But you don't usually get much money for that sort of stuff. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Another alternative is to put an advertisement in the trading post. Do you know that paper? It comes out every week advertising things people want to sell. You have to pay to put the advert in and then hope people phone. Give them as much information as possible and if they're interested, invite them to come and have a look. The hard part is agreeing on a price. No, I haven't seen the trading post. But I should have a look at it, and I could advertise the fridge, the microwave, and the furniture. 
But the kitchen stuff isn't really that good, you know, old cutlery, a few pots and pans, and some plates and things. What shall I do with them? Well, another option is to donate the kitchen things to a charity shop, you know, like the Salvation Army or Saint Vincent de Paul. Why don't you get a second-hand shop to give you a quote first? Yes, I could do that. Find out how much they'll give me, and then decide whether to sell them or give them away. But I've still got the clothes. A charity shop will take them too, as long as they're in good condition. And even though you don't get any money, at least you know that someone who really deserves some help has benefited. That's a good point. I'll advertise the expensive stuff. The furniture, and donate the clothes and kitchen stuff. Let's go and buy a trading post, and you can help me write the advert. Well, actually, I'm interested in buying the fridge and the microwave, depending on the price, of course. Okay, let's see how good you are at bargaining. That is the end of section one. You have half a minute to check your answers. Section two. You will hear a speaker talking about whiskey. First, you will have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good morning, everyone. I would first like to welcome you to the Glengarry Distillery, where some of the world's finest whiskey is produced, all from local ingredients. Later on in the tour, there will be a chance to sample some of our range of whiskies, but we'll begin by looking at the history. Of our distillery. For many people, Scotland is perhaps most famous for its whiskies. The term whisky actually came from a Gaelic word, which, when translated, means "water of life," a combination of traditional methods and the soft spring water used in the production of traditional Scotch whisky has made it a world favourite. In fact. Exports of whisky in two thousand and seven accounted for two point five billion pounds. That's nearly eighty pounds a second. There are two main types of whisky: single malt or blended. Single malt whisky, as the name implies, uses only one type of grain in its production and is completed as a single process. Blended whisky, on the other hand, Can use a variety of different single malt whiskies and combine them. Many people believe the taste of a single malt whisky to be much finer than a blend, despite the fact that more blended whisky is sold than single malts. The first recorded reference to whisky dates as far back as 1494, but since that time, many refinements have been made to the process of making whisky. Using the term Scotch to refer to whisky has a very specific meaning. It is internationally protected, and only whiskies made in Scotland, using largely local ingredients, can be classified as Scotch. Despite strict regulations about using the term Scotch whisky, it is legally acceptable to use barley from any part of the world to create a Scotch whisky. But here at Glengarrett. We only use local barley. It is more expensive than importing it from other countries, but it gives our product the unique taste for which it is world famous. This region has been producing whisky since the 1750s, 
although Glengarrett has been operating for just over 200 years, having been started in 1807 by three brothers. Apart from the introduction of more modernised equipment, the whisky process here at Glengarrett has changed only a little since those times. The company remains small, employing fewer than 25 people, with most of our staff being the third or even fourth generation of the family to work in the distillery. You now have some time to read questions 16 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 16 to 20. Now we will move on to how our whiskies are made and where we get our 100% natural ingredients from. I would like to ask you to keep your questions until the end of this part of the tour. There will be plenty of time for questions later on. Now, if you'd all like to follow me, we'll start the tour. One of the most important ingredients in whiskey is barley. The barley being used for the production of whiskey is carefully selected as it will largely determine the quality of the whiskey when it is ready for sale. The first step towards making the whiskey is when the barley is malted. This process takes a few days, during which time the barley is spread out on the malting room floor, as you can see here. After about three days, this is then dried out. The malted barley is laid on racks inside the kiln, a special furnace used for drying, and it is here that a lot of the taste of a whisky is determined. Here at Glengarrett we use peat, a type of soil rich in vegetation that gives the whisky a very smoky flavour. The dried malt is then taken to the dressing room, where the pure malt is separated from unwanted material and other debris. From the dressing room, the malt is then sent to the mill to be ground down into a coarse flour called grist. The grist is then fed into the mash tun along with hot water, where it is stirred for some hours. This process is repeated three times. The remaining product is then put into washbacks, and yeast is added to start the fermentation process. This is then distilled before being put into oak casks to mature. Some of our older whiskies may take up to 18 years to mature properly. Right, this is the end of this part of our tour. So if anyone has questions, then please. That is the end of section two. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a student and a tutor talking about academic life. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi John, please come in. As you know, the university has set up these meetings to give all students the opportunity to talk to their tutors about the subjects and how they're doing academically. But this is also a chance for you to talk about how things are going generally. 
living in the student accommodation, sharing facilities with other students, that sort of thing. And don't forget, everything we discuss here remains confidential. So, how do you feel the year is going so far? Well, yeah, no problems really. I'm doing okay with my subjects. I just got 82% for my last history assignment, so I'm very pleased with that. Things aren't going so well with my language classes, though. I'm starting to wonder whether I should have just taken the history lectures this semester. Hmm. So, what grades are you getting for languages? Well, I'm just above the pass level for French, but I think I might fail my German classes. I just can't seem to get the hang of it, and it's so much harder than when I was in high school. Is there anything your German tutor can do to help you, do you think? No, not really. I mean, all my classmates seem to be okay. It's just me. But then again, I haven't really divided my time equally between the subjects, and I have started a part-time job recently that gives me even less time. Ah, oh, I see. Do you think that you should have a job if your studies are suffering? Well, I wouldn't choose to, but I need to earn a little extra cash to pay for some of my living expenses. I have a student loan, but it's limited and doesn't last the week. And the job is only four hours a day, Saturday and Sunday, as well as one evening during the week, so it's not too much time. I think I just need to be a little more disciplined with my studies. Do you have a study plan? You know, a schedule of when you will study which subject and for how long? To be honest, I made a plan at the beginning of last semester, but I didn't stick to it, so I haven't made one for this semester. I don't think it really helped me very much. Well, if that's not the kind of thing that works for you, how about creating a study group with some of your classmates? You can discuss the work you've studied that week and talk about those things that you are finding difficult. It may be that one of the other students can explain something in a way that you find easier to understand. You can find a quiet table in the room in front of the library to meet, or if that doesn't work, you can come and see me and I'll try to find a quiet room for you in this part of the school. Hmm, that's actually quite a good idea. It would give me a chance to catch up, and it would certainly make me feel more confident. I'll try to get some people interested and see how we go from there. Okay, good. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And what about student life? Are you happy where you're living? Oh yes, it's much better than I thought it would be. In the first semester I didn't really like living with so many other people, but now I've come to quite like it. Most of the people on my floor are very friendly and we all get on well. It's good to spend some time with people that are studying different subjects, too, otherwise you spend too much time talking about coursework and assignments. I am finding it a little difficult to get to the French lectures, though. It's on the south campus and takes me nearly half an hour to walk there, and I only have 30 minutes between my French lecture and my history lecture, so I have been late a few times. Do you have a vehicle of your own? No. Well, I have a bicycle but I haven't used it since the end of last semester, when the front tyre went flat. OK, well, how about using the bus? It runs between the two campuses, so it would get you there in about 10 minutes. It only costs £24 for the semester. Yes, I looked into that, but I don't get out of my history lecture until 12 o'clock, and the first bus leaves then, so I never get to the bus stop on time. The next bus comes at 25 past, so that would get me there late. Oh, I see. Then I recommend that you look into getting your bicycle fixed, then. You can't afford to be late, especially as you're only at a pass level at the moment. Have you talked to your French teacher about why you are sometimes late? I keep meaning to, but I never get round to it. OK, well, I think you ought to make that a priority as soon as you can. Have you had any thoughts about what you plan to do over the summer break? 
we encourage all of our students to enrol in our work placement scheme, where the university will help students find a job doing something that they think they might like to pursue after graduation. Have you had any thoughts? Well, as I said before, I really need a little extra money at the moment, and I have been offered some extra shifts at the restaurant where I'm working now. So I'll probably take that, even though it's not what I plan to do in the long term. Maybe next year I'll be in a better position to look for something more in line with my future career. I see. Well, have you considered applying for an extension to your current student loan? Yes, I have, but unfortunately I was turned down. I didn't qualify for the hardship grant I had applied for. I guess I need to learn to live a little more economically and stop going out so much. That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear a speaker talking about the impact of migration. First, you will have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Have you ever thought about moving to another country? What do you think encourages people to want to move overseas? What effects do migration patterns have on the countries involved? A concept that can have a negative impact is the brain drain, and that's our topic for today. The brain drain refers to the situation that occurs due to a large-scale immigration of educated or technically skilled individuals to other countries, which has a negative impact upon the country that they have chosen to leave. Usually, this migration is prompted by a desire to escape conflict, a country plagued with health risks or political instability but may also simply be inspired by a desire to improve one's economic opportunities. Brain drain is usually regarded as having an economic cost to the country being left behind. Since immigrants are calculated to take with them the fraction of value of their training sponsored by the government, and there is an economic cost involved in finding skilled replacements to meet market needs. The term brain drain was first used to describe the immigration of scientists and technologists to North America from post-war Europe. Brain drains are commonly experienced by developing nations where harsh or troubled living situations encourage nationals to wish to leave for brighter, healthier, and safer futures. However, this type of migration can also be seen in seemingly developed and relatively comfortable economies 
but where people prefer to move to neighboring countries perceived to have on offer even better, brighter opportunities. An example of the latter is the situation experienced by Canada with migration patterns to the United States of America. As early as the 1860s, a trend towards preference for life in the United States was observed by Canadian administration when it was noted that the majority of immigrants arriving at Quebec were en route to destinations in the United States and had no intention of remaining in Canada. A government agent in Quebec, Alexander C. Buchanan, suggested that prospective immigrants should be offered free land to encourage them to want to remain in Canada. In the 1920s, it was observed that over 20% of university graduating classes in engineering and science were immigrating to the United States. But the percentage of technically trained Canadians leaving the country dropped from 27% in 1927 to under 10% in 1951 and 5% in 1967. Even so, between 1960 and 1979, over 17,000 engineers and scientists immigrated to the United States. Today, there is still a brain drain in existence from Canada to the United States, especially in specific sectors. These include the finance, information technology, aerospace, healthcare, and entertainment industries. This migration preference is put down to higher wages and lower income taxes in the U.S. Research indicates that engineers and scientists are also attracted to America by the greater diversity of jobs in the United States and a perceived lack of research funding in Canada. The United States itself is fortunate and rather unique in that it does not necessarily experience a large-scale brain drain to other countries since it has remained for many decades the destination of choice and perceived as the land of opportunity for many skilled migrants migrating from other parts of the world. The United States, however, does experience unevenness of distribution of its skilled worker population. A study conducted at the beginning of the 21st century showed a definite preference for migration by young, skilled workers toward the west coast and southeast of America. Over recent years, the United States of America, like other countries, has found it impossible to avoid rural depopulation. The movement of skilled workers from the countryside to urban and suburban areas, which has negatively affected the economies of rural communities across the country. The situation that occurs when many trained and skilled migrants choose to move to another country is called a brain gain. Particularly as birth rates tend to decline in developed nations, it is, a cr it is crucial for governments to attract individuals who are able to add value to that country's economy and skills pool. In 2000, at a Canadian symposium, the relationship of native skilled workers choosing to leave the country and their replacement by their immigrant counterparts who wish to migrate to Canada was discussed. This simultaneous but converse relationship is sometimes referred to as a brain transplant. Over recent years, Canada, along with several other developed nations, has been proactive in encouraging interest from migrants able to contribute positively to the country, its economy, and community. Canada has a thriving economy, one of the top ten in the world, which is centered on the vast array of natural energy resources and mineral reserves, including oil, gas, gold, nickel, and lead. The country also possesses strong aeronautics, automobile, and space industries. The popularity of moving to a smaller Canadian community has increased amongst migrants. One of the major appeals being that trends show immigrants in smaller areas are more likely to earn equal income to the Canadian-born population much faster than those who decide to make new lives in larger metropolitan areas. Over recent time, the smaller Canadian communities have begun to work proactively to develop their own immigration strategies to attract and encourage newcomers to their own particular part of the country.
That is the end of the listening test. In the real IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.